Ken Litchfield is here with us tonight to discuss the subject of fermentation. He's a 30 year member of the MSSF, serving much of that time as cultivation chair. Ken found his way here from his home in Texas after a stint in Los Angeles. His schooling is in biological illustration and has worked in drafting, design, and graphic design, but the common thread throughout his professional life has been teaching. There are more details about Ken in his biography at the MSSF website in the meetings page. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. no. um, basically, I'm going to give a talk tonight that's going to be a lecture, but it's going to cover a large amount of territory and mostly be a philosophical type of discussion. Um, if you've ever done any fermentation, you probably have questions about how this all works. And uh, rather than talk about any one particular type, I'm going to do a continuum of wine and alcohol fermentation through um, vinegar. And basically that is what you do with kombucha. So kombucha, we can imagine, if you would like to think of it this way, as the middle part of fermentation for wine and vinegar because as you're making kombucha, it's going from sugar to alcohol to vinegar, all in one batch, so to speak, and using more than one organism at the same time. Many people who ferment wine would like to not have it turned to vinegar, but in reality, um, if you get some kind of a bacteria in there that's going to turn that vinegar turn that wine the alcohol into vinegar you will end up having a tart beverage that you did not intend to have um, most people would consider that to be a contaminant or something bad that happened but if we look at it from this point of view um, we have a philosophical way of looking at things and that is that we have both the organisms that we're working with and the environment that they're working with they themselves can create and modify their own environment depending on how you set it up at the beginning. So to start with, I'm going to start with a thing called sugar extracts. And nowadays you can easily get, uh, just go by Trader Joe's and you have this, I don't according to my screen it's backwards, but I guess maybe you're seeing it correctly, I don't know. But it shows organic powdered sugar. My screen showing it backwards. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's uh, you can buy this organic. It is plain, pure sucrose sugar. That is what you want. Just plain, pure white powdered sugar. Preferably powdered sugar because it's much finer and it will extract much better. And the reason that you want to make these extractions is so that you will extract the essence of whatever herbal property that you would like to have from herbs or fruits or vegetables or other kinds of foods. You can extract out of them their essences by using a sugar extract. Once you have it extracted into sugar, which obviously doesn't sound particularly healthy for most people, uh, you can convert that sugar into either alcohol or vinegar to use it as um, other food products, either for sweetening or for um, using for alcohol or alcohol extracts. You can also then distill the alcohol if you wish so that you have highly refined alcohol that has the um, herbal properties within the distillate. Um, we're not going to be talking about distillation. That's a whole nother science and art, um, but we will be talking about how to ferment these things into high alcohol, if you wish, a high alcohol wine or a high alcohol mead. Um, basically, I'm going to be talking about um, a number of different ferments, particularly meads, which are one of the oldest ferments that humans have ever made, 
um, basically because one of the first most oldest domesticated animal that we are, have been associated with is the bees. And so um, once you know how to do beekeeping or once you know how to uh, collect the honey from the wild, then you can use that as a fermentation. Um, most people don't realize this, but most of the fermentations that were originally done had to be done in some kind of a container. Well, in the old and old and olden days, the containers were pre-ceramics, and which meant basically you probably were doing it in some kind of animal skin, either an animal skin like from the hide or an animal skin from some kind of an intestinal bag. And so those bags would be, you just tie off the um, intestinal tract and you basically have a bag that you can ferment into. What that means is that many of the early ferments probably had a very strong umami flavor, regardless of whether that's now considered to be something that you would consider desirable or not. That is probably what many of the early ferments had in their flavoring, uh, umami flavor, a meat flavor, and um, which many of the things we're going to discuss this evening have to do with adding mushrooms to your ferment, which is an umami thing. So having a meaty mushroomy flavor added to your ferments is something that, yes, you can do. Um, if you want to make the very simplest extract using sugar um, and using right now, many of you might be going up to the Sierras to collect morels. That's one of the very easiest mushrooms to make a sugar extract. And once you made the sugar extract, you can make candied morels. So in order to do this, you simply take about equal parts powdered sugar and equal parts morels, fresh morels. The fresher they are, the more moisture they have in them and the more liquidy the syrup that will be made from them is. If you wanna do this as an experiment, the one of the easiest things you can experiment with is rather than morels, just use carrots. It could be orange carrots or purple carrots. If you use purple carrots, you're going to have a very cherry colored syrup very quickly. There's so much moisture inside of carrots that in uh, within like 20 to 30 minutes, you chop up a bunch of carrots, put them in a jar, add sugar in equal parts to the carrots and cover them and seal it. And you can have it sitting next to your um, countertop or whatever while you're working on other things and you can watch the liquid uh, syrup form in the jar right in front of you. This is a very easy thing to do if you have kids and you want to be able to make a sugar syrup. It's simpler than a simple syrup which usually requires cooking. Well if you have kids and they want to make a syrup and then you doing it on the on the uh, stovetop, then you might end up having some dangers with fire or with hot things and burning fingers and things like that. But if you make a simple sugar syrup using only the osmotic process, then uh, kids can do this. And so anyone can do this. If kids can do it, you can do it. Um, simply take any kind of carrot, chop it up, in small pieces, the smaller the faster, the smaller the pieces, the faster it will be sucked out into the uh, sugar and it will liquefy the sugar right in the jar and you will have a colored liquid syrup that is the flavor of carrots. And uh, so that's a very simple thing to do. If you wanted to use morels, you can use morels. If you like the very tiny morels, they're the perfect ones for making candy because once you make a candied morel, if it's a relatively large one, then you're going to have a lot of sugar sweet thing to try to chew and eat. And maybe people like a candied morel, but if they're tiny ones, then that's a smaller amount of candied morel that you would be eating. Um, once you have extracted the liquid out of the morels, you simply squeeze them a little bit, take them out of the liquid and squeeze them a little bit in a press, if you wish, and then take the morels and put them into your dehydrator. And now you will have dehydrated candied morels. Those candied morels can then be dusted, if you wish, with 
granulated sugar, making even more sugar on them. But rather than granulated sugar, they, you simply dry them as is, and now you have candied morels. It's that simple. Um, you can do this same thing with something like chanterelles. Chanterelles have lots of moisture in them. So do porcinis. Um, one of the things that's very fun to do coming up with um, McLeod is if you go, if you, <laughs> if you know the really good spots, there's lots of places where you can collect huge numbers of porcinis, many of which will be what many people consider past prime, but if they've got worms in them, those are perfect for making syrup because it's going to be far more umami. Um, I know lots of people think, oh, if you have worms in your porcinis, that's a very bad thing. However, my way of thinking, it's one of the best things because those are ripe porcinis. They are the ripest. And once you slice and dice those porcinis and put them in the dehydrator, the worms will come out in the dehydrator. They will collect in the dehydrator and you can sweep those up into a little pile and make a special sauce just with the dehydrated worms. Now, many people don't consider that to be a thing that they want other people to know about that they're doing. However, when you find a lot of uh, porcinis, oftentimes they'll be hollowed out in little caverns and you'll see all those holes and eaten areas in the porcini and that's all, every worm in there is porcini flesh. So you're not having anything in that worm except what was already in the porcini. When you make a sugar syrup out of porcini flesh, including the worms in there, it sucks all of the moisture out of the organism, including the worm, but also including any bacteria that is in the worm. So you are killing all of the organisms that are there by osmosis. It sucks the moisture out of those organisms and they cannot survive. Therefore, this is why sugar is considered to be a preservative, just the same as salt is considered to be a, a preservative. So when you suck all the moisture out of your organisms, then you have no more um, possibility for those organisms to continue eating your uh, porcinis or whatever. They will add their flavor, very umami flavor to the syrup. Yes, some of you may be squeamish about this whole idea, but other people are considering that, well, if you have sure porcini worm stuff, then you might just have something that's in high demand. Most people don't have any idea what that tastes like because they've never tried it. Having tried it myself, I'm saying to you that this is a great delicacy. Yes, I understand about some people being squeamish about all these things, but lots of people are, are amazingly squeamish in the mushroom society about um, some things to do with bugs in your, in your mushrooms when you really can't avoid that. I don't know why people get squeamish about it because it's just a fact of life. Um, however, the fact that you can kill the bacteria and yeast and other things that are in organisms in the extracts of uh, foods that you're extracting with the sugar means that what about fermentation? How does the yeast survive in the sugar if you're killing it from the sugar? Well, that's because you're making a sugar extract that is so sugary, it sucks the moisture out of the organism and it kills it. You dilute the syrup and that's what you ferment. So if you make a sugar syrup of any kind of thing, and what I'm suggesting to you is, um, you can do mushrooms, you can do roots, fruits, mushrooms, leaves, and flower petals. Uh, rose petals make an extra beautiful um, rose petal syrup, which actually is something that was used by the um, Persians, you know, probably 800 BC or so. So it's been around for many centuries. This process is not like even though I say, yes, I invented this process, it's obviously uh, a scientific process with osmosis. So it's something that can be reinvented many times. Um, but 
if you think creatively, you can capture the ferment, the uh, osmotic syrup of anything that you can just wander through Trader Joe's, for example. Go to their cheese section and you'll find all kinds of moist cheeses. If you get a dry cheese, there's not gonna be as much syrup off of it, but if you get some kind of a camembert where it's all gooey and you add equal part sugar to the cheese, oftentimes you'll find that the cheese syrup that you make from the cheese will be a very butter flavored syrup. And then you can use that for flavorings of all kinds of things. Um, many of the cheeses, um, excuse me, many of the syrups that you make would be perfect. Like if you want to make a cheesecake and you pour morel syrup over the top of a cheesecake is a little drizzle. Most people have no clue what that would taste like, but it's definitely worth experiments. You yourself may have um, skills and so forth in culinary, in the culinary realm. And so if you get creative, you can create all kinds of syrups that maybe no one else, you've never tried, and you might not know that they could try. If you want to, you can just take your favorite enchilada dinner, put it into a jar, add equal parts sugar to it, chop it all up, stir it all around, and it will extract, suck out the moisture of the enchilada dinner and make a enchilada syrup or a tamale syrup or whatever pizza syrup, whatever flavor that you wanna make, you can make that and then ferment it into a wine or a kombucha or a vinegar. So any of these, you can extract the original essence out of whatever it is that you would like to uh, extract from. And then those extracts, what I call X factors, many of these X factors are like unknown factors. Many things we've analyzed the food and found all these different properties that are in the food. And many of them have been named and they know all their characteristics and so forth, but many of them they don't. So obviously there's going to be many S X factors, especially in mushrooms, because many of these wild mushrooms, people haven't really analyzed those very much. So you might be collecting all kinds of X factors in them. And they might also have all kinds of good health properties that you probably need X factors in your diet that you don't realize that you're getting. If every single factor that you get in your diet was named, then you would have all of the things you need. However, they've never found the diet that's everything you need. That's why astronauts, they can send them up into space and give them a diet that's all got all the ingredients that are required for health in there, but they're gonna get some sort of scurvy disease, just like the old um, Navy guys got vitamin C deficiency disease. That's how they first discovered if you're out there long enough and you have a diet that's deficient in certain kinds of properties, those X factors at one time were unknown and now many of them are known. So what I'm saying to you is if you would like to, you can extract from all kinds of mushrooms their essences. When I say essence, they're going to have the flavor. So you may or may not know everything that's in a chanterelle, but you can make a chanterelle syrup that has the essence of chanterelles in it or porcinis. Very nice porcini syrup can be made of just the porcini pour layer. That is probably one of the most umami things that you can get. And if you get it so it's so ripe that maybe it is also loaded with worms and it's all gooey and it's all supposedly nasty and everything, it makes a really, really umami syrup. And you can ferment that. Once you ferment it, and once you've uh, extracted it with syrup, any organism that's in that, bacteria, anything that you're afraid of or whatever, those organisms are killed. Now, what we have to also consider is if you make a sugar extract and you know that maybe it's chitin in mushrooms that cause people to have stomach upsets or gastrointestinal problems or whatever, which is really wide range of possibilities. That could be everything from burping and farting to puking and shitting or other things. Um, so in reality, when you are um, considering all these 
possible problems that you may have from making a sugar extract, I am saying, yes, you do need to pay attention to some mushrooms that you might think eating a fermented syrup that's been fermented into alcohol or kombucha or vinegar, that is possible that perhaps you are taking some kind of toxin from that mushroom and translating it over. Now, whether or not um, that's just the chitin in there that most people think is what give, you have to cook it enough to break down the chitin so you don't have gastrointestinal upsets. Well, maybe that's the only thing you have to worry about and maybe it isn't. What I'm saying to you is there's a certain amount of unknown factors here. You can make your favorite enchilada dinner and make a syrup out of it and make an enchilada wine and it, you'll be fine. But can you do that with any mushroom that you want? I would say you could probably drink whatever amount you want carefully and see what kind of reactions you might get. I wouldn't personally take an unknown mushroom that you don't know what your own reaction is if you haven't eaten it. Like if you've eaten it many, many times and you know, oh, you're fine with that. I'd still say, well, if you've never made a wine out of that, you might be extracting certain things out of it. And it may or may not just be chitin that you're getting in your diet with that. And it may or may not cause you some gastrointestinal upset, which could be a very mild situation. And you say, oh, well, that's so mild, I don't care because I really like the flavor of this thing. So some people, you know, they don't really care that it's going to cause them a little bit of burping or something else just because that's inconsequential compared to the wonderful flavors and everything else that's in that mushroom. Um, so I'm saying somewhat caveat, caveat emptor, buyer beware, be careful when you're out there experimenting with these things. And, but um, making a sugar extract is very safe. Once you've made the sugar extract, this sugar extract can last probably at least several weeks on the kitchen counter shelf, no refrigeration necessary as long as it stays sealed up. If you have it sealed up, typically what you want to do is, for example, take all of your carrots, mix them with sugar, leave a little space at the top and cover the whole thing with sugar when you seal it. Once you've got it all covered with sugar, all the liquid comes out into the, um, the, the sugar extract all the liquid out of the um, carrots, they may float to the top, but once you've sealed it and it's covered with sugar, anything that's floating in the air left in the jar will land on a layer of sugar before it turns to syrup. And anything that would sprout in that would be automatically extracted by osmosis and killed. Therefore, you will have a sterile syrup with no cooking. No essences are lost from the process of making a syrup. It's all the volatiles are inside the jar. You haven't cooked anything. You haven't lost any of the nutritional values. No vitamin C is destroyed by heat. None of that happens. It's all in the sugar. Once you've made the sugar extract, it's good for probably several weeks, I think, based on my own experiments, that there is sort of a in it that's fermenting it. Now, sometimes you may discover that um, you didn't use enough sugar and the syrup that's made is able to have some kind of an organism growing in it, but then you will notice that some gases are given off because fermentation is happening and carbon dioxide is released, building up pressure inside the jar. If that happens, then you will know that yes, you didn't use enough sugar in order to make the extract totally osmotically pure. Um, these all require some experimentation and trial and error, and uh, but very, very simple to easily make a sugar extract just by using roughly equal parts sugar with whatever it is that you would like to extract. So when I say roots, fruits, and mushrooms, those all have lots of moisture in them. 
leaves and petals have less moisture in them. They for, therefore, they should be used certainly with powdered sugar compared with uh, granulated sugar for roots, fruits, and mushrooms. All of those have so much moisture in them, it's easy to extract just with plain old granulated sugar. If you use uh, powdered sugar, if you've got leaves like chocolate peppermint leaves, that's great, makes a wonderful syrup that you can add to all kinds of other things and it will have the essence of chocolate peppermint in from the leaf of the chocolate peppermint plant. Um, hopefully, if, if you are proper naturalist, you're going to be not just collecting all of your things from the wild and doing wild crafting, you're also going to be cultivating your own plants and mushrooms and so forth. So you're domesticating what you find in the wild. Um, that's part of being a cultivator. It's also part of being a responsible collector in the wild where you take advantage of the fact that you've got um, all these wonderful things that you can collect in the wild. Well, you also want to give back to the wild. So if you cultivate them and propagate them and return them to the wild, then uh, you're doing your part to maintain your part in nature, which we all are part of nature, regardless of whatever some folks may say about that. Um, if you have um, a uh, fresh made syrup and you want to ferment it, Basically, you have choices. One choice that you have is to do with uh, wines. And traditionally, mead is a thing that you can use um, honey as your syrup, as your sugar. So when I say that you can use white sugar as your extractor, that's because it's a commercial commodity that's very easy to now get at the store as a commodity. Honey is far more expensive and honey itself has other flavors in it. However, properly, if you figure out what you like, you can figure out your sugar extracts using sugar and then use honey to make the proper herbal extract that you would really like to have in honey and then use honey to ferment a mead off of your honey fermentation. Um, Every honey is going to have properties that were in the fl original flower that the bee was collecting nectar from. And so those herbal properties are in each of the honeys, not just the flavors of it, but all of the herbal properties are there. And you add those to your mead whenever you're making your healthy mead. And so mead is probably one of your most ancient fermentations that humans have ever made. And most likely uh, from the very earliest times, it included the whole beehive, which means there's things like bee maggots in it, the, the baby bees, the little maggots of, of bees being raised by the mama bees. And uh, the, uh, also the, all of the bodies that are in the honey that might be added to the fermentation. And this means you have animal flesh or animal proteins that are added to the fermentation. Anytime you're doing that, uh, just like with meat, if you add proteins to this, you may have other properties that are added to this. So what we have is a very important concept that is used by all people who taste wines and things like that. That is you use your own uh, taste buds, your own mouth as your um, experimental device. You are you, in your mouth, it's full, full of mucous membranes. You can absorb through your mucous membranes and have them go directly to your brain through your um, circulatory system and uh, bypass your digestion. And you can taste things in your ferments directly and say, hmm, I might get a headache off of that if I have fermented some kind of a meat product or some kind of, when I say meat product, I'm talking about any kind of insect product. It might be maggots in mushrooms. It might be baby maggots of bees. It might be flesh of meat. It might be uh, horns. Like in the ancient times, you would um, ferment a bag 
of a goat bag or a goat stomach or something like that, carry your wine around in that and drink the wine straight from the bag. But it might also have that flavor of the goat bag in there, depending on how it was cleaned and how it was uh, prepared. But once it's fermented many times in that bag, it's going to have mostly the flavor of the wine that was made inside that bag. It's also that you're, when you add these various uh, meat things to there, you end up having meat proteins that could be added to the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the organisms that are doing the fermentation take what they are given and can create other things, other products, byproducts uh, from the fermentation of the ingredients that they're working with. If you have a lot of animal proteins in there, you might have extra strange possibilities that are going to cause more mm, reactions in your brain than just regular old vegetative stuff. So most of the vegetative things you don't really have to worry too much about. We pretty much are, uh, there are certain, there are certain families of plants that have certain uh, properties in them that could be poisonous, could also be hallucinogenic, could also be added to their fermentation intentionally. And so one of the reasons why you have your um, mouth laboratory is so that you can taste these things and see whether they're going to have some effect directly on your brain just by tasting them in your mouth and feeling what's happening into your brain directly. Um, this is a very immediate gratification method of testing. It does require experience. It does require um, many people who are wine tasters know that, yes, you cleanse your palate, taste the wine, swirl it all around in your mouth, get it all through your mucous membranes and let it go to your brain and you can feel Hmm, yes, I really like the results of this. This feels good. Or, hmm, I'm not so sure. Uh, many times they have discovered that, for example, uh, very rarely there is a rhododendron that's in the Himalayas and the bees make a honey off of that and that is a hallucinogenic honey. Very powerfully strong. Um, but it has to do with the rhododendron, the properties in the rhododendron nectar that the honey has been uh, extracted by the bees. Um, that's a well-known, not well-known, but it's many people know about it if you know about it. Um, amongst more of these rarefied knowledges, you'll find that, that you might be able to take these various things and be the only person who's explored that particular thing. And so what I'm saying to you is you might want to take strong notes or do a lot of extra work or so forth to make sure that whatever you're coming up with is something that's safe in the long term. Now, whether or not that's going to be one of those long term safe things like oh, men on horseback, supposedly you can't eat those from Europe and I'm just tossing one of the multitudes of different mushrooms out there that have reputations that maybe you shouldn't really eat large quantities of those. It's gonna be so awful for you. How often is it that you're gonna get a man on horseback that you're gonna eat so many of them that you are gonna have problems with it? Uh, I would like to have that problem myself. I've never had that problem. Um, but I could see that perhaps it could be but most of the time, some of these problems are just so rare that they're, they're, not so, they're statistically unlikely to be a problem. So that's where everything that you have to consider is, what is the statistical likelihood that this thing may or may not be a problem? That is something that you have to consider at all times when you're experimenting with things that are new knowledge. And so I'm just giving you that bit of forewarning so that whenever you're making your own syrups off of any of these mushrooms or other products, then you uh, keep this in mind. If you take your syrup, you can then ferment it. It could be a honey syrup. 
that you have actually used honey as your extract. And now you're making a mead, an old, good old fashioned mead that you're going to um, have all kinds of extra ancient properties in that mead. In the olden days, root beers had a lot of different kinds of um, rare roots, many of which were mushrooms, and some of which they weren't actually sure what th th there was a there was a, a root called sarsaparilla back in the day. Sarsaparilla is not the same as sassafras. That's another one that's added to root beers, but it's a root of a, a tree, whereas sassafras is a root of a vine. There's also some things called poria cocos. That's actually a mushroom that was often confused with sarsaparilla root. On the market, there's a maybe 20 to 40 different rare and unusual roots that were added typically to root beers around the world back in the day of when root beers were very popular, maybe 500 years ago when they kicked off. And uh, those root beers all became various kinds of elixirs and for various reasons, uh, sarsaparilla ha happens to have um, sapogenins in it, which are precursors to human hormones. When those human hormones get fermented, they create human hormones. Uh, the precursors create human hormones in the fermentation process. The guy who figured out in the 20s and 30s, figured out how to make birth control pills and testosterone and everything, used the root of the sarsaparilla plant in order to figure out how to um, create synthetically um, various kinds of hormones. Up to that point, they could only extract a little tiny amount of, of testosterone from tons of bull or pig testicles and so forth. And that was a very elaborate process. Now, hormones are something that is an industrial process. It was created by a, syn a company called Syntex in Mexico. The guy who invented it was named Russell Marker. and even now it's kind of hard to find out information about him, but he's the guy who pioneered all of this. And so you would not know this except that he basically went to Mexico and learned all the same stuff that Maria Sabina taught the folks of um, hallucinogenic mushrooms. He happened to learn all about um, testosterone, plants and mushrooms that were added to early elixirs of root beers and for fermentation. It just so happens in order to make each of the different kinds of hormones like progesterone or birth control pills or testosterone or whatever, there is a fermentation process that is the trigger that turns the original thing into the hormone that you want. He learned from the Indians how to do that and this is he, he's all of his patents or can be found in uh, chemical journals and things like that from the 30s. And so this is knowledge that, yes, I've researched and I'm imparting to you. But what I'm saying is there is a long tradition of having herbal root beers and herbal meads that have herbal properties in them for a reason. And these were considered to be elixirs for a reason. So whether or not your ferment will have these particular properties in it happens to be something that, well, maybe you can figure out those processes that they were using back in ancient times because they had all kinds of ritual methods for creating these processes. This is just an interesting aspect of fermentation, however, if you extract using your syrups or honeys, you can collect the various herbal properties that you would like to ferment into your wine or into your kombucha or into your vinegar. Now, if you take a wine and you have sugar in the wine, that is the original source that you're gonna convert the sugar into alcohol. When you first ferment this, all you need is your sugar or honey syrup to add to whatever ingredients, like usually fruit juice, that you're going to use as your base 
for making your wine. If you add yeast to it, you could do that. You can get your yeast from basically a commercial source if you wish. Um, one of the pl best places I suggest that you go to uh, is a place called Oak Barrel in um, Oak um, in uh, Berkeley. It's on San Pablo in Berkeley. They're a very good, reputable, um, knowledgeable place. And they teach classes and so forth too. I recommend that you can delve in further there if you wish. Um, but you yourself can find all kinds of things online. You can take, but, but what I'm telling you is I'm giving you the basic information so that you yourself can figure out how to make a high alcohol wine from using your syrups as your base uh, product. Most people think that you need to take like three pounds of honey and add it to a gallon of water and you're going to and add your yeast and now you're going to get your fermented wine and and it'll be a mead. Well that's fine but one of the things to keep in mind is that honey itself does have anti-biological properties in it so that when the bees are making their honey the honey itself is anti-biological. It will kill off uh, certain organisms that are in the honey so that the honey isn't destroyed for the bees baby food and for other uh, reasons. If you uh, use the honey for fermentation, you're going to dilute that honey somewhat. As you use, if you were to use straight up three pounds of honey, I say that would not be a good idea. What I suggest that you do is use one third of the amount of honey that it's rec usually recommended to make your mead because you are having such a strong anti-biological effect of the honey itself, it will have a detrimental effect on the ability of the yeast to actually reproduce and ferment the honey, uh, ferment the wine that you're trying to make, ferment the mead that you're trying to make. So instead of using the full straight up amount of mead, excuse me, straight up amount of honey that's recommended, instead use about one third to one half of the amount that's recommended. Do your first fermentation, let it all get fermented, turning that alcohol, that sugar into alcohol. It will not be as high alcohol as it could be. However, you then let everything settle out. It's going to make a bunch of dregs in the bottom of the jar and a bunch of other things because what's going to happen is when you mix the honey and sugar with the water and the fruit juice and so forth, the first thing that's going to happen is um, uh, within I don't know, a few minutes to a couple hours, uh, it's going to kick off and start fermenting and producing a lot of carbon dioxide. It can get very volcanic so that it will actually possibly spew out of the jar that you put it in. It can be very vigorous. And so what you want to do is not have it so vigorous that you fill the jug up too much. And so these are things that you need to take into consideration. I'm not necessarily saying how much, but if you take a typical one gallon jug, don't put it above the shoulder line of the jug that you're filling it with. Otherwise it can bubble up and overflow and come out through the bubbler at the top. You typically get a bubbler at Oak Barrel with a stopper. You put the stopper in the jug, the bubbler is in the stopper and you put water in the bubbler and you can see the bubbles of carbon dioxide blowing through the stopper as you're fermenting. Well, when that bubbling stops, then you know that the carbon dioxide has stopped being produced and now that fermentation process is over with, usually in about 28, 24, 48, 36 hours, you're done. And then you let it sit for several days and then you decant it. Then what you do is you make a secondary fermentation by using the next, next batch of honey that you would normally have added at the beginning process. You add it uh, maybe the next one third. If say you use half your honey, 
fine. Now you use one third of what's left to do your second fermentation. Then you let that uh, crank make its bubbling and so forth. Then decant that, then add the next batch of honey. And so you do maybe a secondary, tertiary, quaternary, quintiary fermentation. So you're doing one, two, three, four, five fermentations instead of one fermentation. This is more sophisticated and allows you to build up the alcohol level in your ferment so that you will have a much higher alcohol ferment than if you just tried to do it straight from the beginning. Almost always you're going to have some screw-ups that happen just because honey itself is, as I say, anti-biological and it will have an effect on the ability of the yeast itself to do the fermentation of the honey. So far better is for you to use less and or more diluted honey at the beginning uh, of your process and do more fermentations till you use up the recommended amount of honey that you would have used instead of adding it all at the beginning. Hopefully that all makes sense. The concept here is that you can make a high alcohol wine by re-fermenting the same ferment that you have already fermented repeatedly. Now, uh, many people don't understand that concept, but it's a very fundamental concept of re-fermenting what you have. Now, the reason that you also want to do this is because it's far more sophisticated and allows you to add at every step. If you're doing five fermentations for one batch of, of wine or mead, then that means you can add other flavorings, other more honey, more different kinds of flavor honeys, uh, more extracts to the next fermentation just by tasting how the thing is progressing as it's being produced. So as you create it, once you've, once you've made your first ferment and it didn't blow up and overflow and make a mess, you uh, have actually um, got all the carbon dioxide bubbled through and it all went well and everything worked the way you planned for it to work. Um, then you you decanted it and it's nice and clear and looks beautiful and you taste that. You can say, oh my God, this is so dry. I have fermented every bit of, of uh, sugar out of this and it's completely dry wine. There is no sugar left in it. Now, if there's sugar left in it, that means that the alcohol, it, that there was so much sugar in the original batch that you didn't use up all the sugar before the alcohol killed the, um, the yeast that you're using. So the yeast itself uh, will commit suicide, so to speak, in its own waste product, which is the alcohol. So you're taking the sugar, converting it into alcohol, and in the process of converting into alcohol, it is killing itself. So there's this balance between the death of the organism due to its own waste products and the balance of having the um, sugar get used up. So the whole thing to make a dry wine is you will end up using all of the sugar and converting it all to alcohol if you do it so-called properly. Now, if you want to have a sweet wine that ends up being somewhat sweet, there's nothing wrong with that. You simply could add that to the very end. And that's also a way that you can have bubbly because if you bottle up just the right amount of sugar inside of your finished product, it will ferment inside the bottle, making a little extra carbon dioxide. And when you pop it open, it will fizz and pop out like champagne. So there is a whole science and a whole trick to getting your ferments to make extra carbon dioxide in the bottle without blowing up the bottle and breaking the bottle. There is a critical amount of rendering that you have to do to make sure that you have just enough sugar in there to turn it into carbon dioxide inside the bottle without busting the bottle. Now that right there is a trick. So as you're more sophisticated in your fermentation process, you can create that special um, 
fizziness or champagne mead, if you wish. And um, that's another feather in your cap, so to speak, if you're able to do that. Um, so let's just say that you want to have a very high alcohol mead. It's far better that you do several fermentations and keep, keep adding more sugar, but less each time than the original batch. So you would maybe add 50 to 60% of all of your sugar that's necessary in the first fermentation. Then you add another 30 to 50% of what's left of what you would have normally added at the very beginning. And then you, for the second ferment, and then you do a third ferment, and then a fourth ferment, and maybe a fifth ferment, or however many it takes, until you've made a very dry wine that is very high alcohol. The higher the alcohol you go, the more likely you will have a intense, you know, you're, you're going to have a, 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 an intense alcohol effect in your wine because it's going to be high alcohol. If you get somewhere around 20% of alcohol in your wine, that's a very high alcohol wine. It could be a mead or champagne or whatever. 15 to 20% is considered pretty high. If you do that, it's possible that you could reach very close to the magic number of somewhere around 22%. Most yeast in existence cannot handle more than 22% alcohol they all die at 22%. So that's a magic biological number in fermentation, 22% alcohol. That means, okay, you're almost at one fourth alcohol. Therefore, if you're distilling one fourth alcohol, you're having to do less distillation at one fourth alcohol. That's why you ferment a very high alcohol wine first in order to distill that batch of wine into high alcohol distillate and get your spirits that way. So uh, oftentimes nowadays, it is possible that there is some genetic engineering that's going on because now they're doing things like ethanol making. And so you're trying to create ethanol for uh, automobile use. And in order to do that, they've genetically engineered some yeast so that they can handle somewhere around 25%. I don't think they've gone above 30% yet, but that's the goal obviously is to get as high of an alcohol as possible so that you'll have less uh, work to do to distill it into some kind of high alcohol ethanol that you can use in burning in your engine or whatever. Um, in most cases, you're not going to want to genetically engineer this. Uh, in most cases, genetically engineered alcohol for ethanol is not going to be something that's considered to be edible because it's not food grade, it's for fuel, um, car fuel. Um, so once you're starting down that pathway, uh, you have to keep in mind that any kind of genetic engineering that's happening, it may or may not be food genetic engineering. Uh, if it is food genetic engineering, then supposedly there's a whole bunch of safety things that should be done that may or may not actually be being done. Um, once you're down that pathway, you yourself could be breeding your own organisms in traditional methods of breeding them so that you can get high alcohol yeasts from your own products that, well, you are growing high alcohol yeast intentionally that can handle the waste products that most yeast can't handle. So you could make a breed of high alcohol yeast. You can buy these yourself at places like Oak Barrel. There is a yeast called Turbo Yeast. It's very nice to use. Uh, typically, they also call them vodka yeasts because they use these to make um, high alcohol wine and then distill into vodka. So it's called a vodka yeast. It usually is somewhere around 22% alcohol that it's produced, sometimes up to 24 or 25%. Those are high alcohol yeasts, but they're traditional yeasts that have been adapted to being highest that they can be of handling their own waste product. 
Um, so this is another aspect of doing your fermentations. When you have this wine that you're now making, um, let's just switch now for talking about kombucha and vinegar. When you have your alcohol that you're making from sugar, you're fermenting the sugar into alcohol. At any moment, that ferment can be um, turned into vinegar if you happen to have a yeast, uh, excuse me, a um, bacteria that gets in there that is a vinegar bacteria. Now, many people think, oh, this is not something I want to have. However, if you're making kombucha, obviously you do want to have this. What happens when you're making kombucha is that you're fermenting the sugar from sugar into alcohol. At the same time, you're fermenting the alcohol that's being produced directly into vinegar in the same container. Therefore, you're going from sugar, sweet sugar, to sour vinegar in one drink. At some point, the sugar, it's being converted into alcohol. That alcohol is at the same time as it's being produced is being converted into vinegar. Therefore, your product, your drink is going from sweet to sour in the same bottle. This sweet to sourness is what people find the best balance with on the flavor that they like for their kombucha. You add sugar at the beginning, it's then converted into vinegar, but it's converted by two organisms. One of the organisms is the yeast that converts sugar into alcohol. The other organism is a bacteria that converts the resulting alcohol into uh, vinegar. This is a process that happens in continuum. In other words, as the sugar is converted into alcohol, the alcohol is converted into vinegar. It's all happening at the same time, but it's in a continuum and in the kombucha. To get the right balance, you're drinking it at the point where you think, oh, I love the sweet tart flavor of this drink at this point. At any moment, you can say, oh, this is the perfect kombucha that I like. Therefore, I'm now going to put this in the fridge, chill it down. The metabolism of the organisms of both the yeast and the bacteria now is slowed down by the refrigeration and it holds that flavor in the kombucha for the extent of several weeks. You now have, oh, what a wonderful flavor of kombucha. Now, if you start with your kombucha to be some kind of a syrup, or in the case of using a honey as your extractor, then you would have a thing called jun, J-U-N, as your drink instead of um, kombucha. Jun is simply honey sugar instead of white sugar in your drink. Many people consider honey kombucha to be more sophisticated or better and so forth, healthier than uh, white sugar. Uh, but let's just say that typically when you have some commodity like um, tea, black tea or green tea from China or from India or, or from Southeast Asia, that is a commodity that you can buy year round. It's dry. You simply add water to make your tea and sweeten the water with sugar. And now you can ferment that water by adding kombucha mother to that sweet tea. That sweet tea can be turned into any kind of kombucha flavor that you wish, simply by using some other commodity than tea. It can be evolved very quick and easy by going through a evo evolution process. What typically happens, and most people think that you need to give uh, you're going to give away your kombucha mother to other people so they can start their own kombucha mother. You don't need the mother part. 
And that mother part is this leathery thing, which I call the mushroom. Remember, we're in the mushroom society, but the mushroom itself isn't really a scientific thing. You know, it's kind of like, oh, it's a, it's a toadstool, it's a mushroom. It's not really, uh, it's a pruning body. It's a whatever, but a mushroom itself isn't really a scientific thing. It's a, it's an herbal thing, basically. Well, if you want to think of it this way, the kombucha mother in itself is a mushroom. It's a SCOBY, a, uh, that's an acronym that means a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, SCOBY. Symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. However, that is a misnomer. It is not truly only a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. There is one other aspect that you must consider, and that is it's a SCOBY YA. The YA part is and human. YA. The SCOBY part of it is the bacteria and yeast, but the human, you can't have that bacteria and yeast unless there's a human involved in this process. Therefore, it's truly called a scobia. If you think of it that way, then you are truly thinking about what it is you're actually doing. You're not left out of the process. You are the process. You can't make that. that those scoby things can't happen without you being involved, period. So might as well call it truly what it is, a scobia. Proper technique is that you are evolving this mother from being um, this leathery thing. You don't actually need that leathery thing to give to someone else. All you need is the liquid that that leathery thing is living in. So most people think, oh, I have to cut off some of my mother and give it to somebody else with some of the juice. The juice is what's important. The juice is what you can evolve into any other commodity. If you take the mother and you transfer it over, you can think of the mother as being like a little civilization created by a bunch of tribal organisms that are living in the liquid. Those little tiny organisms, the bacteria and the yeast that are floating in that liquid, making the kombucha go from sugar to uh, sweet sugar to sour vinegar that bunch of organisms in there floating in that soup actually make the um the tribal organisms that build the civilization that is this leathery mushroom mother that leathery mushroom mother if you don't take it with you you can create and evolve it over to being any kind of commodity you want. Therefore, you could have a flavor of kombucha that could be orange Julius because you're using vanilla and orange juice instead of um, oriental tea. It doesn't matter what your original commodity was, you can evolve it over to something else. So for example, if you're pouring off your kombucha uh, juice into a container to drink it you typically don't take all of it off you take a large portion of it off and you leave some of it with the mother add more tea to the original batch while you have this new batch and you drink that put it in your in your uh, in your uh, fridge however you can also add other flavors to that poured off batch and have it start going fizzy and make it more flavorful than just what was originally in the tea. That is because the, the mother is not necessary. The organisms that are in the liquid are what's necessary. They will build a new civilization and if you don't add the old civilization and carry it along, they can adapt over to a new commodity of anything you want it to be. So you could have orange Julius, or you could have root beer, or you could have uh, watermelon cucumber, or whatever, as your flavoring or as your juice that you're using. Today, you can buy cherries frozen year round. You can buy raspberries frozen year round. Those are commodities. You can make a raspberry kombucha year round.
you don't need tea. You could make tea. You could also make cannabis kombucha if you want. We've done this. That's that's not difficult at all to do. I wouldn't say it's your best flavored kombucha, but yes, you can make cannabis kombucha. And that is going to, and of course, it will have the principles that are in um, cannabis. You can make a cannabis syrup. It's very simple to do. One of the things that you can um, do with any kind of leaf is to take all your leaves that you want, like chocolate peppermint or cannabis or whatever it is, put them in a big bowl, wet them a little bit so they're completely coated with water, massage them and add sugar to that and massage the whole thing so that you have all of the leaves coated with sugar and then put them into a jar, press it down so that everything is, is under the liquid that's now being extracted. Once, once you've uh, put the leaves into the bowl and you've started to massage them with sugar on them and some moisture on the leaves, then they will be completely uh, coated with syrup. That process that starts sucking the moisture out of the leaves or sensimia pieces or however you wish to collect them, all of that stuff goes into a jar and sugar is added to the top of it so it's completely submerged in sugar and now you will have a sugar extract from the leaves that has all the properties of the herb that you're extracting. Now there are many many different kinds of herbs that you can do this with um, so it's a matter of um, what kind of edibles you would like to make so to speak. Um, and I'm not advocating for any particular of these things, um, but if you would like to make your own cannabis kombucha, you can do that. It's the same as making any other kind of commodity that you can get year round. Right now, you can go to Trader Joe's and buy a bag of frozen cherries, so therefore you can make cherry kombucha year round. And it's very tasty, it's very easy to do, and it's quite pretty and and um, and uh, um, it's a good foundation for adding other properties to it so that you have many herbal um, characteristics and many herbal X factors that you put into your cherry kombucha. What's going to happen is after you've made your cherry kombucha and you've allowed it to uh, grow for a while, it will make a cherry kombucha mother. That cherry kombucha mother is now adapted to cherry kombucha. It is on a, a new mother that you can share with other people if you wish to share that mother. But once again, the mother itself is not important. The juice is what's important. The juice is what you use in order to adapt to something new. So all of the organisms that are in floating in that juice are the ones that will be able to adapt your um, your uh, drink to um, new commodities. So if you start thinking about this as a continuum, then you know that, well, if I wanted to, I don't actually have to have a vinegar mother in order to make vinegar. All I need to have is a kombucha mother that will continue making, and it doesn't even have to be a mother, you can continue making, um, you, you can allow it to make a mother, but that kombucha mother, if you let it get tart enough, it's simply going to be more vinegary than it is sugary. Most people want to have a certain sweet tartness to their kombucha, but if you just let it go, it will turn into vinegar. And at some point, the yeast in there is not going to die. It's going to still be adapted to be able to handle more uh, vinegar acid. It will be able to handle that, but it's not going to be a pure um, vinegar yeast, uh, excuse me, vinegar bacteria culture. It will be having some yeast in it. Therefore, it will continue to, if you want to, you can add more wine to uh, or more kombucha or more sugar if you want to your kombucha simply to make more vinegar 
So you don't really need, once you've got your vinegar made, excuse me, once you've got your kombucha made, you can consider that to be the same as your vinegar mother. So some people are very much into uh, growing vinegars. Well, that's fine, totally good. But if you would like to, you can also adapt your vinegar to being a different kind of vinegar than the one that it originally started with. So if you have a red wine vinegar, you might want to change it into some kind of nutty Amontillado vinegar, where instead of using red wine, you're using some sort of a white wine or an Amontillado wine that's going to have a nutty flavor. And so you will have a nutty flavored vinegar, but you're using it as if it's kombucha. So if you start, um, if, if you happen to have a batch of kombucha, and it's already pretty much tart, so it's mostly vinegar, you can simply start adding, if you wish, only um, Amontillado wine, which is very nutty flavored, and have that converted over into being a vinegar that's going to have a nutty flavor. It's simply going to take the wine, the alcohol that's in the wine that you're giving it and convert it into vinegar. And if you don't have a lot of red wine in there anymore, it will gradually change over to being a different color just because it's no longer got the stain in it that it had before with the red wine. So it is possible to convert these things through a gradual process of evolution and evolution can happen right there in your kombucha jar. That is possible. Um, so let's just say now that we have created all the sugar syrups that we would like to have and we can make um, pizza kombucha. Certainly we can do that very easily simply by having a commodity that is made by you can just go to your local pizza store every week and buy your pizza, throw it in a jar with enough sugar, and you're going to extract pizza flavor into your syrup, and then you're going to use that in your kombucha to create a com pizza kombucha, and that pizza kombucha then will permit into a, uh, a pizza vinegar. So if you happen to like that flavor of of um, vinegar, then now you have a flavoring that you can add uh, to foods. Um, obviously, I'm saying this somewhat facetiously, but that's only as an example that it doesn't make any difference the whether pizza kombucha or pizza vinegar is something that you would actually want to make. You can see that the process is possible to make whatever flavor that you would like. So obviously some of you may be thinking, well, if that's all it takes to make this, then let me try making it with whatever. I can, I can use these techniques to be creative and come up with my own flavorings that no one else would have. Um, and it might just be something that you personally would like and you're not going to know until you have tried it. Um, I think one of the coolest things is to grow your own chocolate peppermint leaves and make a chocolate peppermint syrup and make a chocolate peppermint syrup kombucha. And that has a very interesting, nice flavor and it's all good. Um, but the, uh, the uh, uses of all of these depend on what you yourself might want to use them for. You just drizzle it on a, on a cheesecake that it's, you, you can make a cheesecake that doesn't have much sugar in it and then you drizzle your syrup on top of it and you could have flavor your cheesecake any way you want to flavor it. Um, one of the easiest things to do is take something like um, Buddha's hand, chop it all up, add equal part sugar to it, and it sucks the moisture out of a very fragrant fruit, a citrus fruit, and makes Buddha's hand syrup. That's very simple and easy to do. You can also do um, quince. Quince is a very fragrant fruit. Chop that up, add equal part sugar to it, suck the moisture out of it while it's a, make sure you get it early in the season before the fruit is dried out very much. If it's a very fresh fruit, it's gonna have lots of moisture in there and it will have a very, very fragrant syrup that it makes. And you can take that syrup and then ferment it 
and the fragrances that are in you, you could take a, a combine a Buddha's hand syrup with a quince syrup and have two very flavorful aromatic fruits that most people don't have any clue what they actually taste like and what they actually could be used for be very unique and no one else is going to know this process therefore when you serve it you're going to have a unique uh thing that may or may not be a conversation piece people won't know where where oh my god this is great where did you get this what is this i've never tasted it before you can actually sell your own buddha's hand syrup if you want quince syrup if you want you can make all kinds of things if you want um, one of the things to keep in mind is that if you're making various kinds of syrups those syrups could be a combination of things like rose petals and elderberries and uh, elderberry flowers and uh, honeysuckle all in the same syrup because you're putting all the flowers into the syrup or you can extract them individually and then blend the syrups together later so either way these are ways that you can take your creations and make creative things out of them um, now basically what we have discussed is in general how to make mead at the very beginning with as a, a wine fermentation um, you can buy high alcohol turbo yeast at oak barrel add that to your um, uh, original batch in a gallon jug for example ferment it and re-ferment it several more times in order to get added flavorings and added ingredients to make a more refined mead by the end of one, one two three four or five fermentations in the same batch now if you do all of that and it happens to go bad so to speak meaning it's turning into vinegar well most people would say oh well it's gone bad throw it out but in, free, in reality, it's turning into vinegar. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So you could intentionally make your mead and turn it into a vinegar, mead vinegar. And that in itself could be the end result that you want to get because now vinegar um, is a, is a, a, a good food product in itself. Um, there are people who make their own sports drinks using both sugar syrups, sweet extract syrups, and uh, vinegars so that there's a sweet and sour aspect to their herbal uh, vinegar process. And then they also add things like um, the, uh, what do you call those, uh, electrolytes, various electrolytes that you can add you can buy on the market so you can make your own sports drinks and you can even add your own caffeine to them so um yes if you wanted to you can add caffeine from from uh, various caffeinated plants but if you want you can just go to the dollar store buy some no dos or some stay awake comes in 200 milligram tablets grind those up and add that caffeine to your sports drink and now you have a sports drink that is going to have caffeine in it um what's simpler i don't know that's about as simple as you can make but you can have a flavored uh, sports drink that could be as tart and sweet as you wish it's going to have its own sugars in there it's going to have your own um min minerals and electrolytes and so forth uh you can make your own um and those can all be herbal extracts just like you go to the store now and you can see all these different kinds of ginseng extracts and various other things um nowadays you can go to the chinese markets and sometimes buy fresh fresh ginseng which means that if you can get fresh ginseng you can chop that up add sugar to it it will extract the ginseng into the sugar syrup and you can have a fermented ginseng root extract um, many of the things that you want to get nowadays yes we have uh, supply chain problems on a lot of stuff but um some things especially like herbal things there is someone somewhere has 
made those things available. If you know what you're doing, you can get these things and order them and, and add them to various products that you might want to know. Uh, a lot of this is going to require that you have some botanical background and herbal background and uh, experimental um, um, processes. You basically also need to know that um, you have lots of, you, you need the experience is what you need to be able to test these things out on yourself so that you yourself are comfortable and comfortable with recommending other people try them and so forth. Always, always it's a good idea, if, especially if it's new or you have had added other um, possibly strange ingredients, uh, that you test them out on yourself yourself and uh, you it's going to be a sample size of one but it's far better that you know your bot bot botany and you know the different families and what kinds of characteristics are in families oh that's the hibiscus family everything in the hibiscus family oh that's all edible oh it's a mucilaginous oh it's a, there's all these characteristics in that particular family uh mint family oh there's all kinds of cool things in the mint family oh there's all kinds of things in the carrot family oops carrot family oh there's a lot of aromatics in the carrot family but there are some deadly poisonous things in the carrot family are you sure that you're going to know all the different things you need to have your 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 botany and your mycology down so that you know the kinds of things that you're getting yourself involved in so that you don't poison yourself or poison somebody else um, so basically when I'm talking about these continuums, this continuum is organisms and their environment so that, <coughs> pardon me, when you have, for example, um, kimchi or any kind of vegetables that you want to preserve, you typically chop them up in a bowl and you add enough salt to them to draw out the moisture in that bowl, massaging them until that salt is pulling out by osmosis the juices that are inside the various vegetables that you're putting in that mix. And then you stuff them into a jar with it's not so salty that it's going to taste salty, but it's enough salt to pull out by osmosis the constituents that are within those um, various vegetables. When you press them together inside the jar and they're all submerged inside the jar and you usually typically put them under a rock or whatever, those, those juices are in a halophilic uh, arrangement. It means that this is salt loving um, bacteria are automatically going to start doing a fermentation on this ingredient. Other things that can't handle the salt are not going to be able to grow in it. Therefore, they, you have automatically created a salt halophilic environment for fermentation using salt. That is, uh, that is in itself a particular type of fermentation that gives you pickled vegetables that have um, organisms in them that are considered oh, probiotic and prebiotic. There's all these pre and probiotic things nowadays that um, supposedly are going to be best for your digestion and all of that. Uh, it all depends on whether you are um, aficionado of those sorts of things or not. But certainly, if you can make the kimchi using salt, you can also make syrups using sugar. Both of those are using the osmotic process to pull out the juices that are inside the various fresh vegetables and fresh fruits and things like that that you're using. <coughs> the um, salt for kimchi is not typically what you're going to be adding to your uh, ferments. One of the things I suggest to people is it is very sophisticated to add just a touch, just a touch of salt to your ferment when you're finished the whole thing. That's a pinch of salt. I use smoke salt, like a secret ingredient. Smoke salt is got smoke flavor in it 
The salt itself, you're only using a small amount, therefore you're using a small amount of smoke, but that's enough so that when you put a, most people don't realize it, but typically in a cheesecake, you're using some salt in the cheesecake. Most people don't pay attention to the fact that yes, you do, but salt simply turns on your, ta your salty taste buds and allows you to taste more complex flavors and if you use smoked salt to turn on your salty taste buds, then that smoke flavor adds a whole dimension to things that you're doing, uh, working on. So salty, uh, just a pinch of salt added to your cheesecake is going to give a whole new dimension to your cheesecake than you might not have realized was there in the beginning. Uh, that can also be added to your meats and so forth. You just add a little touch of salt at the end and it doesn't have any effect on the fermentation process because you don't do it during the fermentation, you do it at the end. Um, another thing that many people don't realize, but one of the best ingredients that you can add to almost anything is vanilla extract. It doesn't have to be the extract with um, alcohol in it. It could be uh, using glycerin or it could be using um, just straight up vanilla beans. If you add vanilla flavor to it, it in itself is a great carrier for other flavors. So you don't want to add so much to give, give it a vanilla flavor. What you're doing is giving it a vanilla carrier. It's a, a heady, so to speak, like a heady, a headiness that you add to your flavorings and it carries other flavors along with it as a carrying device, so to speak. Um, it's not the same as having it vanilla flavored, it's the same as having it vanilla carrying. It's, it's, a, it's a carrier for other flavors. It gives this headiness to your preparations. Um, but what you do is you add just enough vanilla so it's almost vanilla flavored but you can't quite put your finger on it. This is, a, this is what you typically do with most of the flavors that you want to add to something. If you really want to make them sophisticated, you add just enough so you can't quite tell, oh yes, I added orange flavor or I added lemon flavor or I added whatever flavor. I added just enough to add some flavor, but not enough so I can put my finger on there. What exactly is that? So if somebody can say, oh yeah, you added caraway to this. Well, then you added too much. You want to add just enough, so it's like, hmm, what is that flavor? Oh, I can almost put my finger on it. That's more sophisticated, and it will cause uh, a lot more interest in your brain because it's sitting there trying to figure out what exactly is the ingredients in this secret recipe here. Those are some secrets. Um, now, basically, when you are trying to ferment these various continuums, um, most of the things that you make, you're, many of them are going to have things like alcohol in them that are a preservative. Now, if you really like the ferment that you made with a mead and it's only 20% alcohol, and that 20% alcohol is not enough to kill the ferment, it's possible that yes, over time, a bacteria might get in there and turn it, that mead into a vinegar. Well, if you want that to be a vinegar, that's fine. If you don't want it to be a vinegar, what you can do is fortify that wine so that it is no longer going to be a living wine. It does no longer have the yeast that originally was in there in the preparation now you're going to kill that preparation by adding fortification to it. What you're constantly doing as part of your process of making sophisticated ferments and ferment, uh, sophisticated uh, herbal process uh, uh, principles is you want to do something called a rose petal extract. And two of the best roses that you can use for this are Chrysler Imperial and Double Delight. They are the two most fragrant roses with the classic rose fragrance. That they're not, oh, citrus flavored rose or some other flavoring or whatever. It's classic rose fragrance. Those two roses are the most fragrant roses. If you take the, lee, uh, the petals of those roses, you can add them to a big wide mouth jar and fill it with 
um, high alcohol, uh, Polish 96% alcohol. You can buy that at your uh, liquor store. And sometimes it's been a little difficult to get during COVID because now it's available. But, you know, for a while there, it was hard to get ethanol because people were using it for um, hand sanitizers and stuff like that. So if you have high alcohol, you can put one gallon of, of high alcohol into a big wide mouth jar and keep adding rose petals to it all summer long. If you're growing your own roses or you have access to these rose petals, typically in the springtime, you're gonna start maybe around April is a typical time when they're gonna be in full bloom. You collect all the rose petals and put them into the jar of high alcohol and massage them around so they're completely submerged in the alcohol and they will in a, about a couple weeks all of the color will go out of the petals into the alcohol. You can massage them around, squeeze out those rose petals after a couple weeks. And by then, a couple weeks, the next batch of roses are going to be in bloom because the last ones you picked have now made new buds and new flowers. And you have extracted the previous batch squeezed out all of the um, alcohol out of those rose petals using like a potato masher. That's a good way to do it. Um, you press out all of the alcohol from the rose petals back into the jug and then add new rose petals. So if you do this all summer long, it might be 10, 11, 12, 15, 20, flowerings all summer long of the same rose petal bushes that they are making new flowers all summer long. By the end of the summer, you have very high rose petal flavored alcohol extract. This is very sophisticated to add as a fortifier to any mead that you make. It's a trick. It's a trick. It kills the fermentation that you have so that if you add just the right amount, you will be putting up your alcohol in your mead to being somewhere around 30%, which is well above the magic number of 22%, but still low enough so that you don't have so much high alcohol in it that it's going to be, you know, like some um, spirits, uh, vodka, distillate, 40%. If you have it somewhere around 30%, that, will have this rose petal extract that you have used to fortify your um, mead that you made. It kills the fermentation possibilities that are in the mead, so it will no longer be a living, having living yeast in it. However, it will now be preserved for the long term. And preserved for the long term, it will also have in it rose petal extract. Now, if you wish, in addition to rose petal extract, you can make some other extracts that you can add various amounts to, like vanilla extract with alcohol, various other kinds of things that you add as touches to this, and that is all depending on your own taste buds and your own mental judgment as an herbalist as to what you want to have in your fermentation. This is not fermenting, this is a distillate fortification that will kill off the fermentation so it no longer can continue happening. However, you have now added more herbal properties to the finished product. And among the things that you can do is, I happen to know that Siberian ginseng is something that most people don't know what the plant looks like, but you can get that as a root product on the market. Well, you could make a root extract, but if you actually grow the plant, then you will discover the plant itself is extremely volatile and aromatic. You can make an extract that, uh, some of you know what a thing called OSHA root is, O-S-H-A. It's not anything to do with OSHA, the bureaucratic thing. It's um, a root that grows in the alpine areas in Oregon and Colorado and places like that. And it is, you squirt some under your tongue and it is one of the most invigorating extracts you've ever had. However, 
one of the rivals to this is if you grow Siberian ginseng as a fresh plant, the leaves and the berries have this same invigorating property, but are far easier to grow than OSHA itself. It's very hard to collect OSHA nowadays because it's so rare um, that it's not easy to get on the market at most any price. However, Siberian ginseng is very easy to grow if you can find the original plant. If you have the plant, once you've made the plant, you can make an extract of that and add uh, those extracts to various ferments. It's an invigorating thing that it's going to hit you in the face when you try this. So you may want to put that in only certain kinds of your ferments that you want to have as being so-called invigorating ferments. So you don't want to necessarily add, um, like if you make a really fine herbal root beer mead, traditional, that's going to have you know, some wintergreen flavor and some sassafras flavor and some sarsaparilla flavor and all the traditional things that you normally put into a root beer mead and the herbal properties, rose petal extract is perfect for that. But maybe Siberian ginseng extract isn't what you want to put in there. But you could make a very invigorating mead that does have lots of other herbal properties in it that you would add uh, OSHA or uh, Siberian ginseng extracts to that. So um, typically vanilla would be something that would be good to add to a traditional root beer mead that includes uh, wintergreen and sassafras and um, all those traditional root beer type meads that were made back in the day that were considered to be uh, very uh, elixir style. They have, there's a certain thing about these when you taste them that you realize, oh yeah, that's, that's an elixir. I see that. I can feel that. I can taste that. That's not the same as this invigoration thing that you can find when you, when you uh, feel it from OSHA or from Siberian ginseng. So some of what I'm telling you is you would actually have to grow these plants so that you know what these plants do. Uh, so this is more sophisticated than just, you know, uh, you have to actually get hands on and know the plants and do them and so forth. So you will, it's a whole different realm than, than working with something that you just buy as a commodity in, in the herb store. Um, these are not things that you're going to be buying in the herb store. You can buy OSHA root in the herb store, but basically you are making your own uh, root extracts off of that. Uh, but I don't know of anyone who could make um, Siberian ginseng extracts without the actual fresh plant. And nobody that I know of is doing that except me and a few other people who are growing the plant. So you yourself would need to grow the plant in order to do those things. If you were to do them, then you would have a product that you're not going to find anywhere else. And if that's some kind of a commercial thing you want to do, then yes, you could start a business doing that. Um, or maybe you just want to have it for your own personal health pro uh, process. So um, I'm not saying that this is necessarily all the um, aspects that uh, you're going to do with your fermentations. But once you have the principles down as the um, overall um, ideas about how things should be done, you it opens up a whole world of experimental possibilities that um, you wouldn't normally think to do. Like whenever I've told people about, oh, you can make a cheese, sugar, syrup, cheese extract, it's like, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, enchilada extract. Oh, I never thought of that. It's like, well, okay, then it sounds like quite a novelty. But if you start thinking about what can you do with that novelty, then, oh, okay, well, maybe you can make something like churros extract or I don't know what. There's all kinds of things that you can make and you start 
creating these things and you don't know where this is going to lead and it may very well be that suddenly you find that some of the things that you created lead to something completely unique and and a whole new realm of of um, food science or food culinary cool things um, those are some examples excuse me ken um we're coming up on uh, we have eight minutes till the end of the meeting if you want to wrap up and then we can take your questions um what time does the meeting end? Nine o'clock. Oh, you don't go till 10? That's what we used to do at the random. Uh, no, we, we, we usually go till nine. Huh. Uh, I'll take questions as long as people want to ask them. I don't have to stop at nine. Would you like to wrap up your, your presentation? I'll take questions if you want to. Have, if there's folks that have questions, I'll take questions. Do you mean right now? If folks have questions, I will take questions. Thank you, Ken. Um, what mm. quantity of pe fruit, petals, or mushrooms are you talking about to begin fermentation to produce your extract? Uh, depends on the size of the jar that you're going to put them in. If you use a very small jar, or you can, um, and sometimes the flowers or the petals or things like that might be quite small, like at the winter time. You can often find wintergreen in the in the um, in the um, like at Trader Joe's or various places like that. You can buy a plant that has wintergreen berries all over it. Those wintergreen berries might fit in a little tiny jar. You can crush them up in that jar, add sugar to them, but they might be in one of those little um, I don't know what you call them. They're kind of like uh, uh, pudding jars. They're pretty small, but that makes a very intense wintergreen flavored berry syrup that you don't have that many wintergreen berries that are on one plant, but you can pick them all off, crush them up, add equal parts sugar to that, and it will extract a wintergreen syrup right into that little of a jar. Uh, so it depends on the size of amount that you can get. Like um, some people have Fijoa trees. This is the um, guava the special guava that's um, uh, Fijoa guava. It's a big green fruit that when you slice it open, it's got sort of a yellow flesh inside and it's very, tastes like the way buddleia flowers smell. And if you scoop that out, you can make a syrup out of that. However, if you look at the flowers, you will see that they have four big petals on them with a bunch of little bottle brush stamens that red in the center of the flower. If you pick off a whole bunch of white petals on the tree, you can add them as many as you want to a jar, however many it takes you to collect. You might collect hundreds of them off of one tree. And so that however much volume you can collect of that, it will make a very bubblegum flavored syrup from those, rose, uh, from those uh, Pijoa flowers. So it all depends on how much uh, herbal product that you have as to what kind of extracts you might be able to make. Um, but you, you're not really limited on the small size or the big size. It has to do with your abilities to collect the thing that you are working on. So I think it's uh, quite fascinating to taste a bubblegum flavored syrup coming from the flowers of Fijoa trees. Um, most people know that they have an edible petal uh, but they don't usually collect enough of it so they can enjoy the bubblegum flavor. But one way to enjoy that bubblegum flavor is to make a syrup out of it. And so you just collect enough petals and massage them in sugar, powdered sugar, and then submerge them so that they are uh, extracting into a, a liquid and you'll have a bubblegum flavored syrup. I see someone saying something about Matsutake. Oh, it looks like uh, Colleen. Matsutake does make a very um, weird flavored syrup. It's, it's definitely, you want to use as fresh as possible on the Matsutake. And any mushroom, the more fresh it is, the, some of them, you know, they're, they're going to be a little bit dry when you 
pick them, but if you get well, um, well fresh, meaty, liquidy matsutakis, they will have a very aromatic syrup that is made from the matsutake. It's 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 one of those things. I'm not particularly a matsutake aficionado, but yes, definitely you can make a matsutake syrup out of matsutake, and it's a very distinctive uh, flavoring. And and um, I know that people make all kinds of things out of matsutake. But if you want, you can make a matsutake syrup, pour that on a cheesecake, and it's distinctively matsutake flavored. So, so uh, pour that on a yes, pour it on a cheesecake. It's great. So, wow. If you if you take when you make a morel syrup, and then dry the morels, I have candy morels with. Can I have no fear of toxins from uncooked candied morels? Yeah. No fear of what? toxin from uncooked candied morels i don't think well most people are not wanting to uh you're wanting to cook your morels well because they off gas well once they off gas then when you are drying your morels or you're making a syrup out of them once you open the um, jar if there's any gases left in there this possibly that's could be poisonous it all depends this is why i'm saying you have to uh, figure out what is going to be the situation with it if you're cooking them volatile uh, gases coming off of morels could be as dangerous as gyrometrins for most people but if you're doing it under um, well aerated conditions then most of the time you don't have to worry about that if you're going to make a syrup out of those morels i've never had a problem making morel syrup it's just not been a problem. I don't know whether, you know, if the, if the gases were to be contained within the jar, as soon as I open that jar, the gases are released. So they're not in the jar anymore. So I've never had a problem having candied morels or, or anything about morels. I have never worried about it because it's an off-gassing sort of thing. I don't think that they the gas would do anything once it's released in the jar. So if you open the jar, the gases go dissipate, uh, assuming that they would do anything in the first place in that situation. I don't think that um, everything that I've heard about this business about having to cook morels very carefully and all that stuff, I've never heard of anyone ever being poisoned by breathing the gases off of cooking morels. I don't know of anybody who just sits there and sticks their nose right over morels while they're cooking because most people know, well, they're probably going to off gas. Therefore, don't stick your nose right over it. But I, I, I just don't, I think certain things are, you're, you're being too, uh, too careful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the next question is, can I use old leathery rose petals? Old leathery? What does that mean? Sarah, do you want to ask your question? Sarah? Hi, I said old withery, not oh, leather. sorry. Withery. Oh, oh. Leather oh, oh. is the mother. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, if you... Uh, if you're wanting to make a syrup out of rose petals, it's, it's the fresh rose petals is what you need. If you have all, um, any dry herb, it's you you could do an extract of a dry herb, but you would have to re-moisten the herb in order to activate it and have something to suck the moisture out of. So it is possible to take a dried herbs and coat them onto fresh herbs if you wish and have both of them extracted because the dried herb is going to have aromatic principles in the powdered herb. Yes, that can be extracted, but what you do is you pour the powdered herb onto wet herb or wet something, uh, blueberries or, you know, um, coat, coat a bunch of raspberries or something like that with the dried herb you want. Or if you want to have a cinnamon syrup, you can do the same thing. You can dust cinnamon on to things. So it's a, a dry powder, but you can make a syrup 
out of the dry powder by adding it to um, various, like, like one nice thing to do is on, you can take cherries straight from Trader Joe's frozen cherries and just add whatever herbs, uh, spices that you like on cinnamon or cloves or whatever kinds you like. But cinnamon, I really like uh, Vietnamese cinnamon. It's got a high, um, high uh, oil content in the Vietnamese cinnamon as opposed to there, there's several kinds of cinnamon you can get on the market but the vietnamese is very much higher and very lighter in uh oil content and very much sweeter in its uh, body so if you take that particular one and dust it all over your cherries before you make your cherry syrup out of uh, adding sugar to the frozen cherries that will add cinnamon flavor to your cherry syrup. So, and that's how you would do the dry cherry, dry cinnamon extract by putting it on some kind of a wet fruit. Does that make sense? I didn't see any additional questions. Does anybody have additional questions they'd like to ask now? I see 38 new messages. Let me scroll down and see whether I see anything else in here. Um, while um, you're scrolling, James McConchie has been uh, able to collect a, a, a large number of morels this week, and he's inviting members to come over to his place to, uh, to dine between 5 and 7 uh, on Friday night. So um, his address is in the chat. Um, I see some comment in here about elixir, and, and I, I don't know where that's coming from. This is this is just made up stuff. That's not has anything to do with any real reality. People talk about all kinds of elixirs and and things that you can call them whatever you want. This has nothing to do with reality. So, um, but sort of. Uh, what quantity of fruits, petals, mushrooms are you talking about to begin fermentation? Um, I typically like to use a half gallon jug or a one gallon jug maximum. Many people like to use a carboy where it's three gallons or five gallons, but the bigger amount that you use, the more likely you are going to invest a large quantity of material into a, something that may go bad or not be the way you want it to be. So if you use a smaller amount, Typically, a half gallon jug, that is a really nice size to experiment with, and you can get lots of results and have way smaller amounts of ingredients that you can put in there and test and adjust and uh, get results if you put them into a half gallon jug size as opposed to a full gallon or certainly a carboy. It's carboys are so big that you're, you're, you're uh, imagine if you have several half gallon jugs and you take the amount of ingredients that you would have, you can div divvy it up among several half gallons, change all the different ingredients, see which ones ferment and you'll have that many ferments all ready to go and you'll have, uh, uh, turbo yeast is a 24, 48 hour process and then you, by the following week, you can have it all distilled and I mean uh, uh, decanted and everything. That's a very quick way to do several ferments in the amount that some people would do in one carboy. So that this business of using a big carboy is it's not it's it's not nearly as sophisticated. If you're trying to learn how to do things, you want to have many more small fermentations that you can uh, get immediate results with and um, make a small batch. If you have several small batches. You can mix those together and have one big carboy if you want, but um, make a bunch of small ones and then see how the results are. If you, uh, if you know what you're doing and you're keeping good notes and things like that, you can duplicate it again and again, and then you know that you have something that you can replicate. Um, but far, far better to use a smaller amount than it is to use a massive amount that you're going, you're, you're, you, 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 you have a very good chance of 
Uh, candy, candy caps. Yes, candy, candy caps works great. You can make them, you can, you can make candy cap syrup from straight up fresh candy caps, uh, assuming you have some. Um, but if you um, grind them up, once again, you have a powdered candy cap powder, like cinnamon powder, and you can add those to cherries if you want, and you will have candy cap flavored cherries, uh, uh, syrup. Um, Chrysler Imperial and what other rose variety is the best for the rose distillations? Chrysler Imperial and Double Delight, Double Delight. It's a rose that is white and red. It's got a picotty red edge to the rose. And um, if you wanna go through the process, you can cut by scissors off the edge of every petal so that the red you can add to the Chrysler Imperial batch, but then white and gold um, the rest of the petal will give you a different color of syrup without the rose color. If you would like to have a golden syrup, then uh, you can get them from the uh, Double Delight. Um, yes, Double Delight is, Double Delight and Chrysler Imperial are the two most um, fragrant roses. OSHA is dependent on mycorrhizal fungi and attempts to artificially cultivate the plant outside of its habitat have not been successful. I know some people who are cultivating that. So I think some people have figured it out. I don't know whether that's truly, uh, I've heard various things about the mycorrhizal aspects of that. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Um, I've heard some people say it requires bears to cultivate it, so whatever. Um, this lecture reminds me of French cooking shows where the chef explains how to save some dish that has not turned out as planned. It is more intuitive cooking that responds to adjust seasonings. Develop your senses and learn the deep instincts. Yep. Um, let's see. Uh, this lecture, uh, let's see. What is the results of the vote help you? I don't know about that. So um, let me see. Any other questions? Oh, wait a minute. Can you use old withery rose petals? Yes. Okay. That I think I answered that. Um, the... Um, As far as I know, turbo yeast is not a GMO. Turbo yeast is a mix of, of um, uh, it's a high alcohol yeast. They often call it vodka yeast, but you can buy that at Oak Barrel. And typically it comes in a big bag uh, packet that you can, uh, you don't, you just need several tablespoons to put into like, uh, oh, that is another thing. What you don't wanna make sure to do is if you're gonna add yeast from turbo yeast, add it to a cup of the ingredients that you're going to ferment, stir it really well and mix it very, very well. Then pour that mix into your overall mix. Don't try to pour the dry yeast into the overall mix of stuff when you're doing your first, uh, when you're doing your initial fermentation, pour the yeast uh, into some small amount, a cup of the liquid ingredients that you're using, get it all nice and moistened, completely um, wetted uh, because it, it resists uh, by uh, it, what you call it. It's got a, it's got the, um, oh, what's the right word? Hydrophobic. Yes, it's, hydro yes, it's hydrophobic. So you wanna make sure to wet it very well, then mix it with your ingredients uh, in a in a cup of container, and then add that to the whole thing, and that and it works far better than trying to pour the thing in. It's going to cake on the sides and and do a gooey things on your on your on your jug and so forth. So, um, anyway, yeah, let's see if I see any other. Definitely candy caps and matsutake make really good syrups. So you can do uh, lots of things with that. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Sounds like that's pretty much it. <clears throat> well, hey, Ken. Yes. Uh, thank you. Th this has been uh, wonderful amazing inter information. I feel like we got a upper level class on fermentation today and intuition. 
So uh, thank you very much. I sure appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks for having me.